The New York Times is committing a war crime against Russia. Yes, you heard right. One of the biggest newspapers of the United States is itself the perpetrator of a war crime, despite the United States officially not being at war with Russia. Because, you see, you don't actually have to be a party to a war, nor do you have to be uh, in the military to commit war crimes. If you simply breach the laws of warfare during a war, be that your own war or the wars of others, you become a criminal under international law. Naturally, this will have zero repercussions for either the criminal journalist involved, nor on the paper itself. But it is nevertheless worth looking at this case, as it gives us some insights into the twisted mindset of a failing and declining hegemon. I will first talk about the crime the New York Times committed and why it is a crime. And then in the second part, we'll go through the New York Times article um, through which the crime was actually committed. But what exactly did the New York Times do? Well, it illegally exposed Russian soldiers who became prisoners of war in Ukraine to public curiosity, which is explicitly prohibited under the Third Geneva Convention. So here is the article that we're that we're talking about <coughs> in uh, in an article uh, one or two days ago that that appeared. Uh, first, you see how here Russian uh, captives are portrayed uh, in a picture, and then what the article is actually about. Uh, during Ukraine's incursion, Russian conscripts recount surrendering in droves. That's the, that's the title of the article. More than 300 Russian soldiers, prisoners of war, have been uh, processed in a prison in Ukraine, providing the country with a much-needed exchange fund for future swaps of prisoners of war. And then what the article does is actually it uh, it gives you a overview of interviews that this journalist, this Mr. where is he, Andrew E. Kramer, now a uh, a war criminal, that that he did with the with captured Russian soldiers, which is explicitly prohibited by the Third Geneva Convention. And just to show you this, I've got the, the Third Geneva Convention here in in front of us, and you know the the different Geneva Conventions, they 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 do different things. And the third one is explicitly concerned with what are uh, the rights and so on of uh, prisoners of war, because you know one thing I need to point out first, which is that sometimes sometimes we think of uh, being a prisoner of war as something bad, as something that creates insecurity, as something that you that you don't want, and naturally nobody wants to be a prisoner of war, but. It's very important to know that under the laws of war, being a prisoner of war is a privileged status. Being a prisoner of war is a good thing for the prisoners. Prisoners of war get a lot of benefits from the law and are recognized as a special group that to whom some harm cannot be done. Uh, for instance, prisoners of war uh, cannot, just for the act of being uh, part of a, of an enemy military cannot be persecuted for that. Uh, excuse me, cannot be prosecuted for that. Uh, prisoners of war enjoy the protection of international law, so that once the war is over, they need to be immediately returned to uh, to the opposing party. They cannot be harmed. They cannot. You cannot do. Uh, you cannot torture them. You cannot. Um, you cannot try to to um, extort. Uh, things from their from their families for them. Uh, prisoners of war is a status that protects soldiers who fall into enemy captivity. And there is this article number 13, which, which spells this out quite clearly. Let me read this to you. Prisoners of war must at all times be humanely treated. Any unlawful act or omission by the detaining power causing death or seriously endangering the health of a prisoner of war in its custody is prohibited and will be regarded as a serious breach of the present convention. In particular, no prisoner of war may be subjected to physical mutilation or to medical or scientific experiments of any kind which are not justified by the medical, dental or hospital treatment of the prisoner concerned and carried out in his interest. And then, very importantly, the next paragraph reads... Likewise, prisoners of war must at all times be protected particularly against acts of violence or intimidation and against insults and public curiosity. And this provision of uh, protecting, protecting soldiers, pr protecting prisoners of war, 
from public curiosity was so important after the beginning of the uh, full-scale war between Russia and Ukraine back in 2022 that in the summer of that year, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which is the guardian of the Geneva Conventions, you know, they are they 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 make sure the Red Cross makes sure that the the Geneva Convention is uh, is upheld as far as possible. They they are the ones who who um, who are in charge of the Geneva Conventions to uh, on an operational level because for them it's of uh, of course the most important. And they wrote an article about shield the shielding of prisoners of war from from public curiosity in which one of the Red Cross uh, legal experts explains that the prohibition of exposing POWs to public curiosity is driven by two concerns. Firstly, the desire to preserve the dignity of military personnel who have surrendered or have been captured, and the imperative to protect them from harm during their captivity and up on their release. Exposure to public curiosity, the article then explains, also covers the simple disclosure of images of POWs, recordings of interrogations, of private conversations, personal correspondence, and any other private data. You're just not allowed to broadcast private data of prisons of war. None of it. Nothing. Um, <clears throat> very importantly here, this uh, legal expert says that even if POWs appear to make voluntary public statements or willingly participate in the recording of images, disclosure of the pub public remains unlawful. Any decision by a POW is made in circumstances where their well-being depends entirely on the enemy power. The inherent vulnerability of the situation and the high risk of duress that comes with it underpins this and many other provisions of the Third Geneva Convention. It's actually quite simple. Since a prisoner of war is, by definition, in the hands of their captors, of the opposing side, of the, of the enemy, if you interview them and if you broadcast them, even if they say yes, you cannot assume that this uh, agreement was done really out of their free will, but that it had something to do with their situation of being captured. Now, that is precisely what the New York Times did. And they, in this article that I showed you, that I'm showing you here, uh, sorry, let me switch this on again. Um, <clears throat> in this article here, the this uh, journalist is Andrew E. Kramer, the New York Times bureau chief um, for, for Ukraine in Kiev. Uh, he went to a prison. And he interviewed these, uh, these uh, Russian prisoners of war who were captured recently during the, the surprise, Ukraine surprise attack on Russia's mainland. Uh, and one of the things that this article does and why it also matters to, um, to just, to, just uh, to recognize how the article speaks about these people is that it first and foremost presents them not so much as soldiers, but it presents them as conscripts. This word conscripts keeps coming up again and again and again. And it is one of these dirty tactics to, to, to broadcast a message to all of us that these people were A, soldiers of Russia that were like unwilling soldiers who were who were well conscripted right they were drafted they had to join the military they were very young and um it the, the article also avoids the word soldiers although the word um, starts to appear uh, low, lower down in the article it start it always comes back to this to this um, aspect of these people being conscripts so um let me read this to you uh, the the article says that Dozens of captured Russian conscripts were laying in this prison cell that this journalist visited. And that in interviews, they recalled abandoning their positions or surrendering as they found themselves facing well-equipped, battle-hardened Ukrainian forces streaming across their border. The article comes back to this again and again, that uh, Russia was very unprepared and that these people are unprepared, that these conscripts were, were, um, were really in a, in, a, in a bad military shape. And that on the other hand, the Ukrainians um, battle-hardened again, like uh, elite troops that were sent over, it's just in order to make this contrast so stark, right? 
to uh, to uh, mimicking again what we've read what we've read in the New York Times two years ago that Russia is actually a failing army and they cannot fight a war and they are they are unprepared and they're untrained whereas the Ukrainians are heroic and ghost of Kiev and uh, and Snake Island and so on and so forth of how the the Ukrainians are just much better. This is like, it's almost nostalgic reading this, right? That this New York Times journalist found an instance in which he can like really exploit a, a, a moment of obvious weakness that cannot be um, that cannot that cannot be disputed, right, by the Russians. But then, really digging into this to this to this issue of the conscripts, and it's interesting again why because it has again something to do with the uh, the Western mindset of still dreaming, still dreaming, even in 2024 of regime change in Russia because uh, Vladimir Putin was now humiliated. The article continues that the New York Times is, ident uh, is identifying prisoners only by only their first names and ranks for their safety if they are returned to Russia in prisoner exchange. I find this, I find this fascinating that the journalist actually knows that what he's doing here is putting these prisoners of war in harm's way, but he doesn't interpret his own actions and, and the, the fact that they're, cap that they're captured by Ukrainians as something that might be dangerous for them and talking about them, but that, if, that uh, it might be the Russians themselves who then might do harm to them later on, painting the Russians as people who then would uh, who would take revenge on on, cap on their own captured personnel. When this entire endeavor that he's doing here uh, is illegal under the Third Geneva Convention, um, to talking to these people and exposing also parts of their names, and uh, you will see down there, even their age, is highly illegal. Um, but let's, let's, let's continue a little bit with the article. The fighting marked a significant shift in the war. This is back to the main narrative. So the main narrative is interlaced. It's the, the narrative that Russia is now finally, uh, we are learning that Russia is much weaker and what, or Russia is actually losing again. That narrative is interlaced with the, the poor uh, status of Russian forces that were guarding the Kursk uh, area where this incursion happened, right? It's like it, it, it changes between these two. Uh, these two strains, and then in the end, it comes to like some sort, or some form of why this matters. I'll show you this in a moment. The the article reads that Russia's border, it turned out, was defended thinly, largely by young conscripted soldiers, who, in interviews, described surrendering and abandoning their positions. Um, and then it, it's it's the, the article actually says that there's this private Vasily. Uh, only identified by his first name to protect to protect their identity, right? Because this journalist is so concerned about protecting the uh, the identities of these um, of these uh, prisoners of war for whom he obviously doesn't have a lot of uh, a lot of sympathy, because otherwise you wouldn't be doing such uh, such an act, right? And that this general private Vasily apparently said, "I never thought it would happen." And that they were surprised, and you know, this is nobody saw this uh, this incursion coming. So obviously, Russia too was not prepared. Although there are some talks about Russia actually setting this up as a trap, but it is kind of difficult to imagine that this actually is a is a trap when it causes so much uh, pain and harm in, inside Russia. So probably this was the act of a this was a military this was a military campaign that Russia didn't didn't anticipate and therefore had no had no defense um, defenses uh, adequate defenses there and the people who did then the Russian soldiers who were at the border they got overrun and they got captured um, the article continues it could also resonate inside Russia the loss of young drafted Russian soldiers during wars in Afghanistan and Chechnya stirred widespread discontent at home so you can clearly see how this journalist is hoping is hoping that um, reporting about conscripts, uh, captured the Russian conscript, conscripted soldiers, young soldiers, 
being captured in Ukraine, how he hopes that this will have a though this will like backfire on on Vladimir Putin and backfire on Russia and actually weaken Russia's resolve to to fight this war. You can see how there is a very clear political purpose and and war warfare purpose behind the article, and then another one of these war crimes, which is kind of exposing the uh, images of these soldiers. You can even ha halfway see the face of this person here, who's obviously wounded and obviously in distress and who's obviously not doing well. And the New York Times just prints this. It just goes out um, while still <laughs> while still pretending that they actually care about the identity and the lives of these uh, these uh, Russian soldiers, right? Um, the the article further down there then continues by saying that the prison in northern Ukraine, where the conscripts interviewed on Friday were held, has processed 320 prisoners of war so far, 80% of them conscripts. Again, driving home the conscript part that Russia apparently, according to this article, without saying so, works like largely with conscripts. Although it says that the people used in Ukraine are are um, are contract soldiers, but it, it comes back to this conscript part here. Uh, the numbers could not be independently verified. So again, the soldier here, uh, the soldier, sorry, the, the journalist. Although this journalist is obviously um, doing doing the bidding of the. Uh, of the Ukrainian military and of the the uh, of what the United the U.S. establishment would want to read, right? You just you you just listen to what the Ukrainians tell you, and then you report that. And in order to cover your own behind, you then add this little sentence: the numbers could not be independently verified, which just means that you that he took no no he made no effort to actually demand some proof for this for this claim of 320 prisoners. So this is the New York Times. This is just this journalist just giving us the word, the number that he heard from his, uh, from the Ukrainians, right? On Friday, that is uh, last Friday, uh, the prison held 71 prisoners of war packed into basement cells, wide-eyed and appearing to be disoriented. They watched as guards escorted journalists into the cells for interviews. So we he even tells us that he's being led down there by the Ukrainians, right? And that that he saw how, how in how much distress these people were. And then we get pictures of wounded soldiers, heavily wounded soldiers. Again, this is a crime against the Third Chidiba Convention. This is not okay, but it's being done anyhow. The prison, the article continues, provided access for several media outlets, including the Times, whose journalists identified themselves and asked permission for interviews and to take photographs. The detainees were interviewed after being captured and in the presence of guards, so their accounts could not be independently verified. The guards did not intervene and were so at some distance from the prisoners during the conversations. It doesn't make it okay, you know, it doesn't make it okay to do this, even if by that you say that this was, you know, we tried to be careful of these, of, of these uh, prisoners. This is explicitly prohibited. This is, again, exactly what uh, the, the ICRC expert talks about, what you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to uh, broadcast this kind of, of um, almost testimony under duress and under stress and under uh, of prisoners being under mental under mental pressure by their captors and it gets just worse and worse i mean then the the journalist starts to name people private sergey 20 from the region of tartarstan um i mean okay you didn't lose his last name but apart from that you gave us his age and you gave us where he's from how difficult will it be um, to to identify him, for instance, for uh, uh, if for for Russia, if they know who of their people has been captured? You know, um, this is just this is this is tantamount to to outing uh, prisoners of war, right? Um, and again, the, the the article does this in order to under, underscore that it was a chaotic retreat, that the Russians were in disarray, that. Uh, that they were unprepared and that nothing worked as it was supposed to. Uh, the article says that the platoon leader had uh, yelled out a window, there are conscripts here, we want to surrender. And that then they then surrendered to the, to the Ukrainians, right? 
uh, that some lamented being sent with inadequate training on the battlefield again and again and again the journalist comes back to this uh, to the russians being in very poor shape militarily which like just shows you how much of a of a propaganda piece this is apart from being a uh, being a war crime it's a it's a propaganda piece in order to sell the idea that the russians are uh, that russia is doing very poorly and i don't know how the russians are doing uh, it's just pretty clear that if you get such an incursion then there were things obviously didn't go according to plan and that you then uh, that you then try to drive this home this is for the domestic audience in the west to enjoy to take to enjoy the weakness of the russians and to do so by exploiting the, the situations of these prisoners of war. Again, Private Dimitri, 21, from the Komi region. Again, somebody a clear, almost clearly identified. Again, a weak and disoriented Russian defense down here, time and again. And, and these pictures, you know, of soldiers who were, of prisoners of war who are obviously not doing fine. Um, war crime. War crime after war crime. Um, the article continues, for Mr. Zelensky, the influx of prisoners of war eases what had become a simmering domestic problem. And this is the end of the article in which we also learn something about, about the intentions of what should happen with these, with these prisoners of war, which, by the way, I must say, according to what we read here, are being treated in accordance to the Geneva Conventions. They're being kept out of harm's way and so on and so forth. So um, this seems, at least from the Ukrainian side, to be... Uh, a proper treatment of soldiers. The improper part is that the Ukrainians would lead uh, news, news outlets into these prison of war camps and that, they, that the New York Times would just play along with that. It's just like, okay, I got the offer to see prisoners of war, I'm going to do that, I'm going to report about them um, in, in one of the largest uh, US newspapers. So the thing that now that now comes here is that they want that the Ukrainians are hoping to use these people to exchange them for their own prisoners uh, prisoners on the other side. Russia does not disclose the number of Ukrainians it has captured, but it was assumed before the incursion to have more Ukrainians than Ukraine had Russians. And with the current with the capture of all of these soldiers, this seems to change, and that would be a good thing. And then there's a, there's a very interesting part here at the end that says. Um, that there's one mother of a soldier, uh, of a Ukrainian soldier, and this Mrs. Uh, Tetyanya uh, Vishnyak, uh, whose son served with the Azov regiment and was captured and sentenced to 20 years in Russian prison. There had been little hope for his release given Russia's advantage in the number of prisoners of war. Um, and that Shin then says that for all of us, this is a great chance and hope that our loved ones will be exchanged. So the article kind of uh, ends on a heartwarming note that maybe uh, the, the, this Ukrainian man can, can now be exchanged for, uh, for Russian prisoners of war. The thing to note here is that the prisoner of war convention, the Geneva Conventions, they apply on both sides. And the Russians have been, have been keeping their part uh, pretty much, they the, from all that we know, once they once they captured Ukrainian soldiers, and the the fact that this man was sentenced to twenty two years um, uh, prison in Russia can indicate one of two things: either he this person was deemed by the Russians to have committed war crimes, because being a prisoner of war protects you from a lot of things, but if you yourself still commit crimes or war crimes, then you can be sentenced to. Uh, to 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 serve time or even like things including the death penalty if you as a as a prisoner of war for instance uh, start try to escape and you shoot you shoot your guards then you would be that that itself would be illegal you you are not allowed to do that and if you do it then you can be you can be punished legally without that then being a war crime um, so either it was established that this person committed some war crimes or was was punished for that, or and this is more likely because the article actually says that he was from the Azov, Azov regiment. Um, it the, the the militias that are not fighting under in the regular forces of the enemy are not considered prisoners of war if captured. This is why I said in the beginning it matters if you get POW status. Uh, but to get POW status, you need to be part of a uh, of the military of the other side or of a military force under the command of the other side. I mean, you could be part of a militia, but as long as this militia is part of the uh, of the command structure of the opposing side and not just a a, a, um, 
a sabotage, a private organized sabotage group, you would be recognized. But the Azov regiment, we know that uh, for now, has not been under the command of the, um, of the Ukrainians, at least during the first year of the war, before they were uh, before they became before they were integrated bit by bit i don't know how far this goes now and if russia doesn't consider these people prisoners of war then uh, that would explain why he got uh, he got sentenced for 22 years because that's not allowed you cannot you cannot detain prisoners of war just for being part of the other side's uh, military there needs to be some other crime committed again if you're not a prisoner of war then that uh, that's a, that's a, that's a different story um, and here you go. Here you go. I just wanted I wanted to bring this to your attention that again the New York Times is committing itself a war crime by exposing people by by uh, by exposing the misery of prisoners of war. This is something that we should care about. Prisoner of war status is something good. Prisoner of war status should be ex should be extended to as many uh, as many opposing forces as possible because it protects them, it protects people and things that protect people and make sure that they can go back and home to their families on both side, sides, be it the Ukrainians, be it the Russians, is a good thing. Also to the people of the Azov regiment, it doesn't help us if we, if we create uh, more and more hatred amongst these groups and prisoners of wars are extremely vulnerable and they deserve protection and something like this is a disgrace. And this person, this Andrew E. Kramer, is a war criminal, and I do hope that at some point he will be persecuted, prosecuted for his war crime. Thank you very much.